And I tend to focus on relationships and communication. I tell true stories. And, and this one that I'd like to share with you is called Daddy's Little Girl. It was the 13th day of the second month of 1984 when Daddy's Little Girl came into this world. The nurse came in, scooped her up, cleaned her off, and put her in an incubator, a square glass case to keep her warm. I walked over, I looked down, and I smiled. I swear, she looked me right in the eyes and sneezed. <laughs> uh -huh. Gesundheit, I said. Oh no! The very first word I said to my daughter was German. She must have thought she was born in Europe. It took me 20 minutes to convince her that no, this was the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <laughs> every year on her birthday, I tell that story, and every year she laughs. It's amazing how fast 18 years go by, and all the twists and turns as we raised her from infancy in Massachusetts to the high school years in Maine. But I guess those twists and turns were never more evident than on her high school graduation day. And let me tell you about that. It started out like any high school graduation day, I suppose. She awoke at 4 a.m. Uh, to call her friends and speak for hours and hours about what they were going to do with their hair under the cap and what they were going to wear underneath the robes. And, and the plan was that my family was going to be coming up from Massachusetts, arriving, oh, 10.30, 11 o'clock. That was the plan. About 10 o'clock, the phone rang. It was my mother and my sister, Nana and Auntie Jo, calling from somewhere in south central New Hampshire. Evidently, coming out of Boston, they, instead of taking Route 95, they had taken Route 93 and completely missed the state of Maine. <laughs> now they're calling me for directions, and I don't know why, because they can't follow directions. <laughs> but I did my best to get them back on track. And I remember hanging up the phone and saying, you know, this isn't going as well as it could have. About 11 o'clock, Daddy's little dirt girl comes running down the stairs with the final graduation outfit. Uh, white top that was way too tight, a powder blue skirt that was way too short, and cruddy old sandals that were just totally inappropriate for the occasion. I bit my lip, I smiled and told her how nice she looked, and she said, all the seniors have to go to the Merrill Auditorium by 11.30 and I don't have time to wait for Nana and Annie Joe, and out the door she went. Oh, a little while later the phone rang again. Nana and Auntie Jo, remember the trouble with directions? Evidently, take a left off the exit ramp was too difficult because instead of taking a left and coming out to Gorham and eating the $87 worth of food I had prepared, they had taken a right and found themselves lost in Portland. And there really wasn't enough time for them to come out to Gorham, eat the $87 worth of food I had prepared, and then make it back into Portland for the ceremony. So I said, okay, where are you? And my sister says, well, there's a McDonald's across the street, and boy, are we hungry. <laughs> my son and I hopped in the car and off to make a, uh, a rescue over at St. John Street. And as we arrived, we opened the door, and inside the restaurant was total chaos. A young boy had fallen and he had hit his head and there was blood and he was crying and an older woman was trying to calm him down. Her white pantsuit just covered with blood. And then a younger woman was trying to calm down an infant little girl, the sister who was wailing. And the young father was walking around with that look only young, young fathers can get, just glazed over. I don't think I need to tell you, this is my family at their finest hour. <laughs> now, we had to make a decision. Do we go to the emergency room or do we go to the graduation? We, we didn't have time for both. 
<laughs> yeah. Fortunately, both my sister and her husband are medical professionals, and they determined that the boy's injury really wasn't that bad that we could go to the graduation. But the McDonald's manager made sure we knew, not until you clean up the blood. So. <laughs> oh, so we made it to the Merrill Auditorium. We finally got there after the seniors had already marched in, just in time to secure seats in the back row of the top balcony. I looked over and there's my mother and she's got one kid and he's, he's sniffling and beyond her is my sister with the other kid and she's sniffling and beyond her is my brother-in-law. <laughs> well, when the man on the stage announced Catherine Lee Harris, everything changed. My sister's face showed great pride. The blood stains on my mother's pantsuit disappeared. Disappeared. <laughs> and even my brother-in-law woke up and says, hey, that's Katie. And I remember thinking at that point, you know, this isn't going as badly as it could have. After the ceremony, we met up with Katie down in the parking lot. And my family decided that with everything that had gone on, maybe it was better if they just hopped in the car and headed home instead of coming out to Gorham and eating the $87 worth of food I had prepared. So we said our goodbyes, we gave our hugs, and they hopped in the car and headed off in search of the interstate. <laughs> I wonder if they ever found it. I don't know. <laughs> Haven't heard from them since, so who knows. <laughs> my daughter, my son, and I went home, and, and Katie went upstairs to change into her project graduation outfit. And Dan and I stayed downstairs and put quite a dent in that $87 worth of food. A few moments later, this beautiful young woman came down the stairs. She walked up to me, she put her arms around me, and she said, thank you, Daddy, for everything. And then she turned toward the door, and as she reached toward the door, she turned to me, and she sneezed. <laughs> I knew that was... <laughs> Gesundheit, I said. And as she closed the door behind her, she laughed. <clears throat> and I cried. Nice story. Thank you. Now, when you have your moose gathering, yes. I should put it that way, yeah. your, your group, um, you have regional storytellers, you have main storytellers, mm -hmm. you have people specialize in mm -hmm. humorous stories. Yep. Tell me a little more about, you know, who, who, who your tellers are. Okay. Margaret, do you want to talk about a couple of our folks? And uh, the main organization of storytelling enthusiasts has listeners. Listeners. People who are willing just to listen? sit in an audience really? because they just want to listen. <clears throat> we have individuals who are professional performers like Mike and myself. And uh, there's various types of storytellers who perform for entertainment, for a message, for a hope to heal or inform. We have a uh, fairy tale oh, fairy story. Fairy tale is my yes. favorite. Yes. Do people dress up? Do they use their hands, I mean, you know, to tell stories? Yes, we have actually a very French storyteller who sings and does the spoons and plays the ukulele. We have others who act out a character. Mm. I'm thinking of our Vernon Lernan. Vernon Vernon. Vernon Vernon. Who performs with a skit as a scout. Yep. And uh, we also have a third type of party involved with moose, and those are our venue sites. Like this moment, right now, we would recognize as a, a site where it's an opportunity for storytellers to tell. Those are examples of the various types of storytellers. I used to have some individuals from Community Partners perform on the stage at moose shows and share their life stories. One has been here. Yes. Les has been here. 
Les Mason has uh, worked with me and together he learned to share about his stories about living Pine, in Pineland Pine and why that message is so important not to have one of those places again. Right, right. He has developed his courage and tenacity to continue yeah, telling was, his story. Good. Oh, very good. And storytelling, it's a tradition that has started old, since before old, old. there was writing. Before that's there was how, writing. That's how history was passed on. And to be able to continue with that tradition, it's just, it's fascinating to me the different styles that people have. As Margaret said, some are for healing, some are for funny uh, stories, entertainment, some are to teach, and you'll find that most of them are a combination of uh, those things. How long have you been doing it? I've and how been, did you get started? I've been with Moose probably seven or eight years. The organization is probably 10 to 12 years old, I believe. And I just, I used to do a little bit of stage work and tell some funny things, uh, stories that happened to me, real life stories like the one I just told. Mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned that I ought to check out Moose. I go, what's that? Yeah, and nice. so uh, they got me a phone number and I called <laughs> a woman named Jean Armstrong, who was one of the founding members of Moose, along with Deb Friedman. And they've become my family. Um, it's just wonderful. I enjoy going. I can't get to every meeting every month, um, but when I do, I come away just in awe of the talent and the tradition that is continuing. And it's just great. When I came to your meeting and heard Joe Radner, who apparently is very well known, um, there was a conference coming up after that. It was storytellers from all over New England. That was out in Western Maine. The Western Maine that? Storytelling Festival. So it was a weekend, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, of people telling stories, performing. There right? were some open mics. There were some feature tellers. There was a, what they called a showcase of local tellers. And there were, I think, six people involved in that. And then one of the things that they did, which I thought was fabulous, was they brought in people who are EMTs, who told stories oh, of real, real life, real drama, real rescue, um, just awe-inspiring. And I thought that was a great addition yeah, to this is. festival. It's an annual thing, and each year it grows and grows. Are there a lot of conferences and weekend programs going on around the state or New England? Um, yes, uh, we <coughs> have our state of Maine group, the Moose. There is a regional New England group called Lanes. Lanes. L-A-N-E-S. The League for the Advancement of New England Storytellers. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so, See what you learn? Yeah. And from the regional level is a national level, which is the National Storytelling Network, which Moose is a member of as well. The National Storytelling Network, NSN, has an international storytelling event. Mm. Interestingly, once a year, Throughout the whole United States, all storytellers come together in November and perform in a celebration. Mm -hmm. Tell, telling stories and celebrating, called celebration, mm -hmm. which contributes uh, its collections towards the National Storytelling Network but also to the, the local and, uh, groups, their support. And it's a wonderful experience to witness. We have had up to 10 people perform in one night, and they each have a different style of storytelling. It's held in November, usually the third, I believe, Saturday of each month. 
Uh, each Where is it? Where is it held? They change towns? We change. Towns? We, we follow the, the opportunities. We've had it at the, um, the church out at Woodford's. Mm -hmm. We've had it at some of the venues in town where there are stages and, and uh, theaters. Uh, the last couple have been at the Rhines Auditorium in Portland. We used to have it at the, the North Star Cafe, which is no longer there on, on Congress Street. What a wonderful venue that was. What a wonderful group of people. They took us in and, and we had our regular meetings there and the celebration. But look for it in your local newspaper. I will, but also maybe people could come here and do this sure and tell stories with a different theme or you know maybe you'll come back we'd love to so we'd tell me to. moose when and where you meet it's monthly the Again. second wednesday of every month at the portland at 6 30 library the portland public library the rhines auditorium downstairs a beautiful venue there's coffee and snacks and chance to meet with the storytellers. And there's open mic and then there's a featured teller. So it's uh, about two hours of fun and learning and uh, inspirational stories and you walk yeah, away. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Better than you. That I went. On. So maybe we'll be back to do this with some more tellers. I'm Maureen Lyons. This is Margaret Cardoza, Mike Harris, Lion's Den. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>